church family. Happy Sabbath. It's nice to see there's just a few of us, but what a blessing that you're all here today. Some quick announcements. Um, the loose plate offering today will be going to the disaster and famine relief. Okay. Two very important announcements. The normally we have our prayer meeting on Wednesday night on Zoom. It's going to be changed till Tuesday. Okay. And if you've never joined us, please do. If you need help with Zoom, my number's in here. Feel free to give me a call. I'll be more than happy to help you. It's just for next week. Yes, just for next week, as it, as it says in the bulletin. Um, the reason for that change is we have a very important meeting, church business meeting, Wednesday, May 18th, right here in the sanctuary, okay, at 6.30. This will also be put on Zoom for those that can't attend in person. Uh, the purpose of the meeting is meeting with Elder Eddie Heinrich, from the Northern California Conference. Um, it says Elder Heinrich, who is the NCC Youth Director, has been assigned as our district manager to aid Middletown and Clear Lake Church in our search for a new pastor. Okay, so um, I would pray and recommend that everyone be here uh, in person. If you'd like to be part of the process and it'll be a learning experience for us all. To go through, uh, we'll be here at 6.30. May 25th, 7 p.m., church board meeting. And just a quick mention, you see us recording everything here. Uh, we're also listed, the links are here. You don't necessarily have to type in all these long links. You can just do a Google search and type in Clear Lake SDA Church. Our webpage will come up. Same with our Facebook page. These sermons, which are a real blessing for all of us, are being recorded and put on there. So if you'd like to revisit them again or share them with a neighbor or a friend, they are available. Sabbath Fellowship, we'll have a meal after church today. Please join us. And after our fellowship meal, we're continuing with the video series, The Chosen. So you're more than welcome to join us for that. Susan, thank you for the wellness wines. I really, really enjoy these. I actually collect them. So please, everyone, take the time to read that. Thank you, Joe. You're kind. And very important, save the date, May 15th, tomorrow, at the Lake Park Church, Spectrum of Light is sponsoring Gabriel O'Neill, Master Gardener, and Dr. Andrew Chung. And Dr. Chung will be focusing on plant and herb-based protocols that boost uh, immunity. And Gabriel will be focusing on gardening tips to increase productivity, decrease water consumption, which is really a huge thing now. So I would encourage all of you to attend, bring a friend, family member. Are there any announcements from the floor? Or... Okay. Our opening hymn, if you please stand and join us, is number 300. Number 300. <laughs>
Father, we are here in response to your invitation to come and worship. And we are here to hide ourselves anew in the cleft of the rock and to build upon the rock. And I pray that the Holy Spirit will be here guiding that process, guiding our worship, enlarging our hearts of gratitude and loyalty in all that is said and done in some. In the name of Jesus, amen. It's now time for our worship and giving. Our worship and giving today for disaster and famine relief for the General Conference of North American Division. These are the funds that they reach out whenever we have a worldwide crisis, earthquakes, famines, tsunamis, you name it. Um, and also on a national level within our own country. And I did a little research and I was actually really amazed at the amount of help during the COVID-19, the peak of the pandemic that these funds went to. So if you prayerfully consider giving to this. The deacons can come forward with us. We bow our heads. Lord, Heavenly Father, we thank you for this blessed, beautiful Sabbath day. Lord, we thank you for everything that you do for us and you give to us. And we thank you so much for this opportunity to give back to you the love. Lord, bless these funds and multiply their purpose and may they all glorify your kingdom and your sin coming. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 to theirs as the covenant of which he is a mediator is superior to the old one, since the new covenant is established on better promises. Hmm. Aren't we thankful for that? Amen. So I'm wondering if we have any prayer concerns today? There's a, uh, a memorial for Mrs. Coates. Louise Coates this afternoon. Let's pray for those that are attending. Okay. She was around here for many years. <clears throat> I think she taught a lot of people to dance. <laughs> Do we know how John did with surgery? Yes. Um, actually, there wasn't much surgery. Um, I saw him yesterday. He was actually in. Is he still in the hospital? No, he's out. I heard he was doing cargoes in the parking lot. 
<laughs> so, uh, do we know what they did? Um, not, as, not sure exactly, but uh, they, it has to do with his sleep. When he's sleeping, I guess his blood pressure goes way down at certain times. And if he's restfully sleeping, it stays okay, but it, maybe he doesn't always restfully sleep. Okay. I know he, he needs prayer. He's a, he's a, his addiction has an addiction. Okay. And then? I'd like prayer for my uh, granddaughter of the Washington State and her other grandmother. That whole family needs prayer. And I pray that for our children and um, our loved ones and family members and all of our church members that we go through the Lord and through the Father's way. Okay. How's Eric doing? <clears throat> so much better. So much better. Good. Robert? Um, my son, you know, he's been looking for a car. He's very picky, which is good. He wants the right car. The car that's going to last, he said, some bad cars in the past. And, um, but he's he's been really spending a lot of time looking, and he decided last time he's going to stop looking and give it a rest for the Sabbath. He's been a little blessing for that. Good. Yeah. I was prayer for my sister Melanie. She started smoking oh, yeah. and she's drinking. And, and I'm just really concerned about it. She started this relationship with this gentleman here in Clear Lake and uh, he's boosted smoking. But she's a big girl. She can, you know, make her own decisions. And um, also for uh, a lady in our park by the name of Evelyn, she's looking for a car also. What is her name? Evelyn. Okay. And continue prayer for Jimmy. She's still having her heart issues and it's not looking too good. Okay. <clears throat> Joe, did you get something? Yes, um, I was talking with uh, Elder Bill Kood from the Middletown Church this morning, and he's been sick. He contacted COVID. He's on the better side of it now, but he told me, boy, you know, his fever broke, but the body aches were terrible. And I just told him that we would uplift him in prayer here today. Amen. I just want to lift up the people in Ukraine that's still in prayer mm -hmm. because I saw in the news where uh, they're kind of feeling that uh, if this keeps going up, most people in America will grow dull to it and want to be in and not stand behind yeah, it. We can't do that. And uh, I just feel this is something we just cannot give up on. And I would like us to continue to lift them up in prayer. Okay. Um, Rose? shared with me that her brother wants to thank our Clear Lake Church family for the prayers he had in surgery last Tuesday. They removed the eye that had the cancer and feel the surgeon feels it was very successful and they were able to spare the muscles so that he'll be able to use a prosthesis. And um, so we're grateful for that. Rachel? A request from Joan Stanwich for her daughter Connie, who had many coverage so she can go in rehab. Right. You know, the, the daughter had a back accident last month, and that um, that is in the list that's going to go out today, Rachel. Um, Daniel? Yeah. Um, I think we should pray for the uh, process that will happen Wednesday um, with the elder Eddie coming 
to uh, talk to us about the search for a new pasture. And I recently had a conversation with a, a young woman co-worker in one of our clinical offices whose mother has had a very complicated surgical course and is on the mend. Her name is Karen, so I want to lift up Karen. Okay. Robert? Uh, that was pretty long, but I um, want to for my wife and all of my children, family, my wife's mother, um, just <clears throat> for all the pains and situations that they're going through. And um, I noticed there's quite a bit to do down there at the park where our the Adventist yeah. church or Adventist hospital is right center. And I just pray for what's going on there. It looks like a kind of a heyday. <laughs> yeah, I'd, I'd like to lift up a friend that I've met through the health programs. Do you know Diane Brooks? Her husband has been in the hospital for months now. He started out with a cough that had some blood in it, and um, currently he's on a bench, and it doesn't sound very good. And Diana was texting me the other night when we were talking about this, so we need to lift her up. Um. Carol? Yes? I think we should lift up while we're driving and her daughter. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, I would like us to lift up Val and David as he supports her. But Val has been struggling this week, sincerely wanting to be done with math. There are numerous issues with that, not the least of which is that her best friend is her supplier. So for her to make a difference with that, she has to do something about that relationship. But um, God is working on her heart and David is trying to provide support for her. So we need to lift them up. Along with all of our other friends, I think Walt, Aaron, uh, Christina, the last I knew, and I never talked to Christina, she she only talks when she wants to. <laughs> but the last I knew, she had not gone back on drugs, but she was still using alcohol. So um, we just need to remember all of our family that are struggling with addictions. It's a terrible issue, has been? Yes. Uh, we also need to pray for our, the Russian soldiers that don't want to be fighting the Ukrainians. Amen. Yes. Uh, Amen. The Russian people are fighting. The Russian people are being persecuted. Okay. Many of which are on our borders. Okay. We heard from Brian too. Yes, I think Brian was with us earlier. If he still is or not, I'm not sure. But I've enjoyed a lot of time with him. He helped me out a lot. Good. Amen. Good. Mm -hmm. Good. He, oh. he teaches me. <laughs> Good. Yes. Anything else? Carl, Joshua, nice to see you today. Yes. Let's go. Can you put a shield around all of our uh, community and family with this fentanyl? My brothers called me and told me about his granddad and fentanyl, and I've come across several other people that have been um, exposed, and even officers, police officers are really angry with that stuff. You know, just going to help people on the street with it. So um, that's something that's really a concern for our community now, is the fentanyl situation. Yeah. Satan doesn't give up easily, does he? Mm -hmm. No. Surprising they give it to you and you have an operation. Yeah. Well, you know, it's like anything else. They're all poison, but they have to be used properly in order to be able to be used for healing. Um, our friend Heather back in Michigan is home. 
from the behavioral care center. So I would ask that you remember her this weekend. She's with her kids, Chloe and Russell are down in Kansas attending a wedding, as is the other woman who is the half of the, the other couple that were providing family for her. So she's she's by herself today, but um, just keep her in mind. We're praying for continued healing there. And um, I'm, I'm praying for God to deal with that evil that exists in the Harlan legal system as they deserve, and they deserve a bunch. So that's just my, my prayer. God will do as he sees fit. Sees fit. So if we don't have any other requests, would you bow with me this morning? <clears throat> I'm spoken. Dear Heavenly Father, God of the universe, Lord of majesty, justice, and power, we just bow before you this morning in worship. And we want to come to you not like the Israelites of old, repenting because of the bad consequences we have to um, endure, but we come to you repenting because we love you. We want to be your children, your hands here in Lake County. We sincerely want to be your children. And so we ask that you forgive our sins today. Show us what we have yet to confess and we will do it. Cleanse our hearts, Father and fill us with your mind in us for our families, for our community, for our church families. We pray especially for those who are not with us here today, but you see what's going on in their lives. And so we ask that you pour out your spirit and continue to draw them back into community and into faith in you. We thank you, Father, for all the ways that you've blessed our lives, for the marvelous answers to prayer that you've set into motion in the past week, for healing that's occurring, just for all the ways that you have blessed us. And then, Father, you've heard this morning our requests. I would add Joyce and her children to that as they are missing Monty. Just Father, please, we place these in your hands because you see the details in each situation even more clearly than we ever could. And you know what's needed. And so we ask that as it is appropriate, put these people in our, in our radar screens so that we can be your hands and heart to help them know better who you are. Mm -hmm. Father, we just pray for the process that is being set into motion for finding new pastoral leadership for us and for the Middletown Church. Again, you see all of the issues you see all of the candidates and you know who would be best to fill this need. And so we place that in your hands. I would ask that everyone come and participate in the discussion so that no one feels as though something happened without their knowledge or input. Be with us now through the remainder of this day as we fellowship together, that we may be blessed by that fellowship and that we may keep your Sabbath holy. We long for the day when you will come and take us home. We know that we will have challenges between now and then. We just pray 
that we will stand. You don't tell us to attack, you just tell us to stand because the battle is yours. And so today, Jesus is standing and giving it all into your hands. We thank you, we love you. Most of all, we praise you. And we pray these things in your precious name. Amen. Amen. Sabbath. It's uh, good to be here in worship and freedom as long as we have freedom. Amen. Sure. In the 1860s, there were three brothers. John, Edwin, and Junius, who were notorious actors. They did a play together centering on Julius Caesar in 1864. John played Brutus, who was Julius Caesar's close friend, who joined in with the assassination of Julius Caesar. In 1865, John became a real assassin at the Ford Theater where he took the life of President Abraham Lincoln. After that night in April, Edward Booth was never the same. Shame for his brother's crime drove him to an early retirement. He likely would have stayed retired except for a twist of fate in a New Jersey train station. A well-dressed young man was pushed along by the surging crowd as the train came into the station. And in that swell, he lost his footing and fell onto the track in front of the arriving train. Edwin Booth was there and saw the situation immediately. And with no thought of his own safety, locked his leg around the rail and pulled the young man out of harm's way just in time as the train rolled into the station. Amid the sighs of relief, the young man recognized the famous Edwin Booth, but Edwin did not recognize the famous young man he had rescued. Several weeks later, in a letter from the chief secretary for Ulyss Ulysses S. Grant, he learned his identity, which was amazingly Robert Todd Lincoln the oldest son of Abraham, Lincoln. So Edwin Booth carried that letter in his vest pocket the rest of his life. The irony is profound. Two sons with the same parents, same last name, same upbringing, the same profession. One saw fit to save the president's son, one saw fit to assassinate the president. What made the difference? One word, 
choices. Our time of meditation this morning will reflect on the greatest source of inspiration toward the best of choices. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I pray that uh, our time together will glorify your name, will lift up your name, will praise your name, and may the meditation of my heart and the words of my mouth be acceptable in your sight. In Jesus' name, amen. Serious Bible students recognize Abraham as the father of faith within the pages of the Old Testament and the New Testament. He's central in the Old Testament. 14 chapters of Genesis reveal details of his life journey. Um, and a footnote, I put these thoughts together some weeks ago, but I didn't look at the Sabbath school uh, schedule, so there will be some crossover between uh, the Sabbath school lesson and today's homily, but not huge. <laughs> so Abraham is revered as a significant historical personage by a majority of the population of the planet. If you were to carve a Mount Rushmore of faith, you would have to start with Abraham. Even Abraham, the recognized father of faith, had his flaws. We talked about that. <clears throat> Even Abraham struggled at times with believing in God, believing God could be trusted with certainty to fulfill his promises, especially when times got tough and fears crept in. Every believing child of God will ultimately face trials, opposition, tribulations, and difficulties, fearful faith challenges, and griefs. Abraham's life story has a lot of material for us to glean, to instruct and strengthen our own journey of faith. God's call came to Abraham when he was in Ur of the Chaldees in his father's house. His father was an idol worshiper, we are told. And the Lord said to Abraham, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will make of you a great nation and I will bless you and make your name great. So that you will be a blessing. And then you, all the families of the earth, shall be blessed. This is a portion of the Abrahamic covenant, which is the lens that all of salvation is seen through. So what was God telling Abraham? Just like Jesus when he called the disciples, follow me. This represents the quintessential definition of a Christian. A Christian is a follower of Jesus. Notice after Abraham's initial call, and I guess he was Abram at that time, the name change came later, <clears throat> to leave and to follow the Lord, the remainder of God's call was entirely made up of promises. By leaving his family, history, and culture behind, the Lord was preparing or clearing the way to fulfill these promises, allowing for such an amazing future that would become Abraham's legacy. The same spirit who called Abraham inspired the prophet Jeremiah to encapsulate the same call to each of us. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. I think you'll recognize that as chapter 29, verse 11, the favor of many. So the Lord was asking Abraham to give up those things that might hinder his progress in his journey of faith. God was calling Abraham away from everything that might stifle his progress and stunt his spiritual growth. In God's call to Abraham, we can hear the call of Christ to each of us today to follow him. God's promises to Abraham are God's promises echoing down through the centuries to us, each of us. Listen to the Apostle Paul. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. That's Galatians 3.29. 
So what promise? Those seven promises made with the call to Abraham in Genesis 12. Let's look anew with a spiritual magnifying glass at some of those seven promises made to Abraham. I had them all outlined, but for sake of time, we will do a certain number. Number one, I will make you a great nation. Number two, I will bless you. I will, three, number three, I will make your name great. Number four, you will be a blessing. Number five, I will bless those who bless you. Number six, whoever curses you, I will curse. And number seven, all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. And number seven represents completeness or wholeness. And we can take the, away this. The promises of God are what makes us whole. Amen? These promises were made to Abraham just at the beginning of his journey. And yet, as Abraham and as you and as I reach out to grasp the hand of the Master with a modicum mustard seed of faith, even though this faith has a lot of ahead, even then, he was and we are deemed complete within his promises. Paul says it this way, and you are complete in him, who is the head of all principality and power. Colossians 2.10. Brothers and sisters, Jesus is our completeness. In the two verses of promises in Genesis 12, the word bless is mentioned five times. Up to this point in scripture, the word bless has been mentioned only five times precedent times. He blessed the animals of creation. He cast a blessing at Adam and Eve twice. He blessed the Sabbath day. And he blessed Noah and his sons. Within these two verses, God blesses Abraham five times. Obviously, God is introducing Abraham as a, playing a key role in the unfolding of his plan of redemption. The life of faith that God was calling Abraham to was actually the life of faith God was calling the whole world to. So how inclusive was this call? The blessings that God was calling Abraham to enjoy are blessings that belong to any and all that respond to God's invitation to a life of faith just like Abraham did. So how many does God invite? He invites all. This is illustrated sharply in the parable of the wedding feast. Go therefore to the main roads and invite to the wedding feast as many as you find. Passage 2 9. Remember what John the Baptist said when he saw Jesus? The next day <clears throat> he saw him coming toward him and he said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. John 1 29. In the Gospel of John, Jesus said to Nicodemus, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. And remember the residents of Sychar, who said to the well woman, It's no longer because of what you said that we believe, but we have heard for ourselves. And we know that this is indeed the Savior of the world. That's pretty inclusive. John 4.42 Turn to me and be saved all the ends of the earth. For I am God and there is no other. Isaiah 45.22 Again, the, <clears throat> the Gospel of John chapter 1 verses 9 and 12 The true light which gives light to everyone was coming into the world but to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Nothing exclusive about that. Again, Paul said in Ephesians 1, 4, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. 
Now, isn't that amazing? He chose us before he created us. Holy and blameless in Christ is the divine vision of his redeemed. Amazing love, amazing grace. Yes, God predestined the entire world to receive eternal salvation. Unfortunately, relatively few choose to accept their acceptance. Most like Esau, barter their, barter their inheritance for a bowl of porridge. Not that tasty in the eyes of the divine ship. Think about this. The best that this world has to offer compared to the eternal inheritance provided by Jesus is hardly insipid soup. Here in these seven promises, God is laying out a banquet for Abraham and for us as well. The better we come to appreciate these promises, the less we are drawn to the world's insipid porridge. Consider that within these seven promises are God's and answers to Abraham's greatest needs and also ours. I will make you a great nation. In each of our hearts and souls, God has placed a desire for eternal significance. Not just for this life, but for the infinite ages. He has made beautiful everything in its time. And also he has put eternity in man's heart. Ecclesiastes 3.11. All God needed to say to Abraham is I'll give you a son and that would have been enough. But God so enjoys lavishing with promises exceedingly abundantly beyond our imaginations. I will make through you a great nation. Abraham's true descendants are those who share Abraham's faith, not necessarily his bloodline. Knowing then that it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham, and if you were Christ, then you were Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. Galatians 3, 7 and 29. Ponder this. If one of us influences just one person toward Christ's kingdom, the Lord will have made said person a great nation. The, an individual serving as a conduit of grace, a great nation. How could this be? Consider the man. And this might expand your horizons a little bit. That, uh, it is estimated that historically, 100 billion people have lived on planet Earth since creation. Average lifespan right now is 78 years. That's rounded up for the history to 100 years. So 100 years and multiply times 100 billion, what do you have? You have 10 trillion human life years. Well, when 10 trillion years after the millennium has arrived, eternity is just getting started. Accordingly, that one life redeemed in the Christ kingdom will have lived longer than all the cumulative recorded lives on our planet during the rebellion with eons of eternal ages to look forward to. What does this tell us? God has promised to make us into a great nation and he doesn't break his promises. Let us keep believing and claiming these great and special promises. I will bless you. Number two, may I suggest that there is nothing more spectacular than to be blessed by God. What does it mean to bless? To bless is to speak well of. How much has God blessed us? The Apostle Paul answers that. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Ephesians 1 3. 
As believers, we have been blessed with every spiritual blessing. We cannot claim to have deserved any of these blessings. He, the Blessed One, blesses even the undeserving. Our Heavenly Father is gracious, merciful, tender-hearted, gentle, patient, and love unlimited. He delights in pouring out all the spiritual blessings on the sons and daughters of Abraham that heaven can bestow. Certainly he is also righteous and just and will resolve and redeem all the injustice that any of his children has suffered within his perfect timetable. Perhaps the greatest, greatest blessing of all is that God does bless us. He does speak well of us. Amen? Amen. Just as the Father thundered at Jesus' baptism, this is my beloved Son. He was in Christ also blessing his beloved, albeit sin-impaired sons and daughters. Alan White puts it this way. And the word that was spoken to Jesus at the Jordan, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased, embraces humanity. God spoke to Jesus as our representative. With all our sins and weaknesses, we are not cast aside as worthless. He hath made us accepted in the beloved, Ephesians 1, 6. The glory that rested upon Christ is a pledge of the love of God for us. That's Desire of Ages 113. When we place and maintain our faith in Christ, thereafter when God looks on his redeemed children, he only sees his perfect son, and we are accepted in the beloved. That is the good news gospel. What a blessing to know that is truly how our Heavenly Father sees us. I will make your name great, number three. In the Bible, name constitutes character. Those building the Tower of Babel wanted to make a great name for themselves. For themselves. God promises to make a great name for us. American icons are often described and venerated as self-made men and women. The theory of evolution purports that man has in essence created himself by natural mechanisms. From slime and time to protozoan and on to a great mind. But God has given us a weekly reminder that none of these deceptions contain any truth. Moreover, I've given them my status as a sign between me and them, that they might know that I am the Lord who sanctifies them, Ezekiel 20, 12. The Lord does it all. Sabbath is a reminder that we have a creator and a redeemer, who having made us is certainly invested in growing us in faith as we rest in his Good news promises. He makes our names great, brothers and sisters, because we are called by his great name. So skipping to the last blessing in that, those two verses. And you, all the families of earth, shall be blessed. God desires all whom we have contact with and influence toward to be blessed through us, our families, our co-workers, our clients, our neighbors, all these blessings were to be ultimately fulfilled and centered through Abraham's seed, which was Jesus Christ. Abraham was not the blessing. Jesus was the blessing through whom all the families of earth were and are blessed. Likewise, we are not the blessing. It is Christ in us that is the blessing. 2 Corinthians 4, 7 puts it this way. But we have this treasure in jars of clay, earthen vessels, to show that the surpassing power 
belongs to God and not to us. We are just fragile clay pots. It is our privilege to be containers of the presence of God and the blessing of God. Abraham's inheritance and our inheritance is exactly the same. And if children and heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. Romans 8, 17. Everything that Jesus inherits, so will we inherit, just like Abraham. Is that amazing? I think that's amazing. That's his promise. Maybe that's why our new home is called the promised land. What compromises the promised land? Heaven and the earth made new. Genesis 17 says, also I give to you and your descendants after you the land in which you are a stranger. All the land of Canaan has an everlasting possession and I will be their God. So what qualifies one for everlasting possession of the promised land? Everlasting blood. God had in mind with this promise, that of eternity with his faithful, trusting children. So along with all the aforementioned promises, God has, was promising Abraham and his heritage, which includes, by the way, you and me eternal life. The divine goal was never temporal Canaan, but heavenly Canaan, where he could fellowship eternally with his redeemed, all the seed of Abraham. By faith, Abraham dwelt in the land of promise as in a far country, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise, for he waited for the city which would, has foundations, whose builder and whose maker is God. Hebrews 11, 9 and 10. Brothers and sisters, to call these seven promises pivotal might just be an understatement. For out of these flow all the basic constructs of the good news gospel. Interestingly, there is not even an uncertain hint that Abraham was actively seeking God when the call to leave home, as depicted in Genesis 12, was made. You sometimes hear testimonies of someone who found the Lord on such and such a day in such and such a place. The truth is that God found us. Salvation was and remains always his initiative. Humanity did not form a salvation committee and petition God for help. When God found us, we were wearing fig leaves of shame and pointing fingers of blame and doing our silly best to hide from God. Praise God's amazing grace and mercy. He met us where we were and immediately began our redemptive rehab with, by the way, life-saving, life-changing promises. That's what changed Abraham from a son of an idol worshiper to a son of faith in the living God. Abraham didn't know just how God was going to keep or fulfill his promises, but he didn't have to. Rather, he chose, he chose to maintain trust that God was faithful and able and would work out the certain realizations of his promises within his perfect timetable. Abraham, as we discussed this morning, stumbled at times in this walk of faith, but God helped him back up and nurtured the growth of his spiritual maturation. God will do the same for us. We cannot ascertain the future or the unfolding details of providence, but when the Lord calls us, he gives us just enough information to inspire our moving in the right direction. You might recall the headline, go with Greyhound and lead the driving to us. 
That's not a terrible metaphor for the walk of faith. I hear an echo of take my yoke upon you. Again, we are not told what Abraham's spiritual condition was like before God called him away. Notice that God did not utilize a high powered sales pitch, just promise and promise. And Abraham grew in faith in the fertile soil of God's promises. So if we want to grow in faith, we just need to invest in enhancing our exposure to the great and precious promises gifted to us. These promises are the basis of the new covenant. Carol read the scripture in Hebrews 8, 6, that he is a mediator of a better covenant which is established on better promises. There go the title of this dedication time, this meditation time. In the Bible, covenant is the same as a promise. The old covenant is the old promise. The new covenant is the new promise. The new covenant, it was interesting for me to note, actually started in the garden in Genesis 3.15. That was a gospel promise. And God said, I will put enmity between you and the woman. That was his initiative. This was further ratified with Abraham. The old covenant, we might suggest, was initiated at Sinai 400 years after Abraham. So, no, the new is older than the old. Then, remember in Sinai, God said, you know, I brought you here on eagles' wings. Therefore, keep my covenant. And the people answered together, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do. That's old covenant language. Certainly they meant well but they were promising the impossible. Here's the key to understanding this. In the scriptures, one who has made the promise provides the power to fulfill the promise. The good folk at Sinai out of fear and not truly knowing Jehovah, the God of their liberation, but viewing him through the lens of slavery. Through hearts turned to pagan idols via centuries of slavery. They were not yet converted to the goodness of their liberating God. They didn't know him yet. Jesus said, this is life eternal, to know the, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you sent. They needed conversion. They were simply promising in their current frame of mind, the impossible. In Hebrews 11, 6, for without faith, it is impossible to please him. Their ranks, however, when those in their, in their ranks, however, came to know and trust the Lord, when and only then they could look to his promises as energized by his enabling power to fulfill them. Notice that the new covenant has just one letter difference the old. From <clears throat> all that the Lord has spoken, we will do. I would suggest the new covenant says all that the Lord has spoken, he will do. Amen? Amen? We are then believing in God's promises to be fulfilled by his faithfulness, his power, his grace, his mercy, his providence, his love, and his wisdom. The new covenant is better than the old because it's based on better promises. The unbreakable better promises fueled by relationships of love, trust, gratitude, and loyalty. Unshakable promises of God, not to mention covenantal promises, which are mediated by the name that is above all names, 
Listen to 2 Corinthians 1 20. For all the promises of God find their yes in Him. That is why it is through Him that we utter our amen to God for His glory. Do you recall the story of Paul and Silas in prison in Philippi, singing hymns and stocks at midnight? There was a great earthquake, and the jailer was about to commit suicide. And Paul said, don't harm yourself. We are all here. <clears throat> and the jailer came and knelt. said, what must I do to be saved like you? And the response was, believe on the Lord Jesus and be baptized, and you will be saved in your household. That story is found in Acts 16, 25 through 34. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. What a gospel presentation that must have been. I'd like to hear that in the, in the millennium. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their stripes. And immediately he and all his family were baptized. Now when he had brought them into his house, he set food before them and he rejoiced having believed in God with all his household. So what demands did Paul and Silas make of this poor, shaken man? They, they merely presented the gospel of the Savior's love and was willing to die for him and his family for their sins. They merely encouraged him to believe in this Jesus and his promise of salvation. It was the sweetness of the gospel that brought the change. Maybe they're singing hymns before the earthquake while having suffered many stripes inspired an open heart. How could he not accept the love of a crucified and risen Savior that cleansed away all sin and all shame and all unrighteousness? Brothers and sisters, the old, old story still changes hearts today. What worked for Abraham and what worked for the Philippian jailer has not lost its power. There is no greater catalyst than the great and precious promises of God. God's power is embedded within these promises. In back to Genesis 12, and the Lord appeared to Abraham and said, to your descendants, I will give this land. And there he built an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. And he moved from there to the mountain east of Bethel. And he pitched his tent at Bethel and Ai on the east. There he built an altar to the Lord and called on the name of the Lord. So Abraham journeyed going on still toward the south. In academic theological circles, this appearing of the Lord to Abraham is called a theophany, which is understood as a type of physical appearance of the pre-incarnational Christ. Was this perhaps when the future atonement was shown and explained to Abraham? We are not told. Again, in the Gospel of John, Jesus said to his Hebrew brethren, your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it, and it was glad, and was glad. Maybe this was the time when the Lord pulled back the curtain and allowed Abraham to get an understanding. Glimpse of the atoning sacrifice coming in a short 2,000 years. Remember with God, a thousand years is like a day, and a day like a thousand years. Abraham's response was to build an altar and worship. I might add the altar was of unhewn stones, symbolic of nothing in my hand I bring, only to your cross I cling. God made the stones, and we cannot improve upon them, nor upon his sacrifice, certainly not as its own. It's all about his initiative, his plan from eternity past. Note the very large contrast between pagan and Christian worship. The pagan seeks to appease, to win favor with, 
to demonstrate merit, to somehow find God with individual effort. Could this be the background when the, the well-meaning Israeli saints said all that God has said we will do, we will we'll flex our muscles and we will be holy. Within biblical Christianity, God comes looking for us. The good shepherd seeks the lost sheep. Their prodigal father keeps an earnest eagle's eye on the road for any sign of return of his lost son or daughter, to whom he runs with open arms for. His purpose of reconciliation and reclamation. We worship God in response to his loving and saving initiative. Salvation does not come in response to anything we do but only in response to God's mercy and grace in saving us through the sacrifice of his son. It wasn't Adam and Eve's worship that persuaded God to promise he would be their redeemer. Is that correct? That was God's mercy and God's grace operating there right in the midst of their sin. Their response of worship was essentially anchored in their gratitude for God's promised mercy and grace toward them. No one's worship caused God to send his son to pay the price of freedom from our sins. God did that for us when we were still his ungodly enemies. God is always the one who reveals himself to us in some way and our response is to worship when we see him for what he is really like. And that's why the cross is so central. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father is seeking such people to worship him. That was the discourse at the, with the woman at the well in John 4. True worshipers recognize true worship is responsive. We love him because he first loved us. True worship is merely heartfelt gratitude for all the unearned and undeserved favor God bestows on his fallen children and for all his great and precious promises. All these better promises. Look at John 4.10. Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is <clears throat> that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. In other words, if you knew who had been promised and gifted by God and who was standing before you, you would have in spirit and in truth worshiped him. True worship only occurs in gratitude to the amazing gift of God in Jesus. The Apostle Paul exemplified this spirit of worship when he declared in 2 Corinthians 9, 15, thanks be to God for his inexpressible gift. Brothers and sisters, Jesus is an indescribable, inexpressible gift. Amen? It nevertheless produces joy and enriches the soul to attempt to describe what is indescribable, what is beyond description. By God's grace, may we all exercise our gift of power of choice, individually choosing to build our lives upon the great and precious promises of God. Those that are yes and amen in Jesus, better promises indeed. Okay. I think we have a closing song, number 518.
may be effective and transforming in our lives for his sake. Amen.